Welcome back uh, to the second week. Uh, so there are still some seats uh, in the front. Um, so it's a pleasure to introduce uh, Filippo Vernizzi from Paris, and um, he's going to lecture about uh, dark energy. OK, thank you. I would like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, the opportunity to lecture here. Uh, so I would like to tell you that I am very excited uh, um, about being here. Um, I, I know this place very well because I visited ICTP for, uh, uh, at least in the pre-COVID era, I was visiting here uh, almost uh, every year, more or less. And then I was a postdoc here 15 years ago, from 2006 uh, to 2008. Uh, so I really like this place uh, also for uh, histori historical reason. And uh, moreover, in, um, in 1998, uh, when I was starting my, my PhD, I attended the summer school here in cosmology. So that was my first uh, summer school. And to me, it was really my best, uh, the best summer school I, I ever attended. I met a lot of people from uh, all over the world. Uh, with some of them, I'm, I'm still uh, in touch. And uh, it was uh, really great. So I, it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to, to be here. Um, so I will give uh, the lecture on the blackboard. But I have prepared uh, some notes that I will uh, distribute to you. So you can take note, but uh, if you, uh, well, if you cannot, uh, you will have uh, uh, also my handwritten notes at the end. Um, there will be a couple of exercises. Uh, maybe I will skip uh, some calculations, but you can, uh, you can do them uh, later, OK? Uh, so today, well, this morning uh, in the first lecture, I'm going to um, discuss uh, about uh, uh, the evidence that we have uh, that uh, the universe is uh, undergoing uh, acceleration, okay? So first of all, uh, let me uh, set uh, the notation and remind you um, and remind you, um, so what, what is expanding? Uh, so I just write down uh, the friedman lemaitre robertson walker uh, metric, which you probably have seen uh, in uh, the first lecture so with, uh, with uh, Sim. And uh, well, from uh, um, the next uh, equation on, I will uh, always set uh, the speed of light uh, to be 1. So this is the scale uh, factor, A. And then uh, I write down uh, So we have uh, the co-moving uh, angular distance, uh, and then the two angles, uh, theta and uh, d phi. Um, so this is uh, the, the, uh, the special metrics of uh, uh, t equal constant uh, sections. And uh, the function uh, f of uh, k depends on, uh, on the curvature of the universe and can be sinus of uh, chi, chi and uh, hyperbolic sinus of chi depending whether the universe is uh, closed. Flat or open. Okay. okay. So when we say that uh, the universe or the, yeah, the expansion of the universe is accelerating, um, we mean that um, the scale factor is, uh, is accelerating. Um, now, you cannot observe directly the scale factor, um, but you can observe uh, 
you know that the scale factor describes basically the average expansion between, uh, between galaxies. If you neglect a peculiar velocity, the Hubble flow is described by, by the scale factor. So you cannot, you cannot observe the scale factor directly, but you can observe the distances. And uh, in, um, in cosmologies, there are, uh, um, well, two typical ways of, uh, of uh, describing distances. One is to use, uh, so I would say, we want to measure the acceleration. Okay, one has to use uh, standard candles, and the other one is to use a standard ladders. Okay. So, what are standard candles? What are standard candles? Sorry. For instance, this is an example of a standard candles. So in general, standard candles are objects of known uh, luminosity, okay, of known intrinsic uh, luminosity. So let's say objects and what about the standard letters? Exactly, objects of known size. Okay, very good. So we heard uh, about uh, uh, cephids as examples of, uh, oh, sorry, yes? Yes, absolutely, yes, yeah. So um, the question was, uh, are ladders the same as standard rulers? Okay, yes, uh, the, the answer is yes. So it's the same. Um, so do you, do you know the story uh, of Cephids? And do you know who invented the name uh, Standard Candles? Anybody knows? Mm -hmm. You're not allowed to look on Wikipedia if you're on Zoom. Eh? <laughs> Sorry? Uh, so the discoverer of cephates, well, the discoverer of the potential use of cephates as standard candles was uh, Henrietta Swan. And you must tell me how you pronounce uh, this name. Luit. How do you pronounce it in English? Levit. Levit. Erietta. Ah, sorry. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I don't know if you know the story behind. So basically, we are at the beginning of uh, last century, around uh, 1910. And at the time, so Henrietta was working at the observatory of Harvard, I think. And at the time, uh, women were not allowed to operate on, on telescopes. And they were often used as, um, to do calculations as, as computer. Um, so they were not allowed to use telescopes, but they were allowed to look at uh, photographic plates with images of uh, stars, for instance. And they were doing basically machine learning although they were the machine, eh, because uh, they, they had to recognize uh, uh, all the stars and uh, make catalogs on them and recognize the, uh, the magnitude, okay, the brightness of the stars, etc. And uh, what uh, she discovered was that uh, there was a relation between um, the, ma the magnitude, the, the luminosity of the stars, and uh, um, the period of uh, cephids. So cephids are pulsating stars. Uh, the luminosity pulsates and also the diameter of the stars uh, pulsates. And she realized that uh, there was uh, uh, this regularity, uh, so a, a relation between the period and the luminosity that could be used to, uh, to know the intrinsic luminosity of, uh, of the star, okay? 
And uh, at the same time, uh, um, so at that time, uh, uh, distances were measured only with parallax techniques. So basically, you look at the sky, you look at how uh, stars, uh, uh, well, the line of sight of the star moves uh, when uh, the Earth uh, moves uh, around, uh, around the sun. Okay. So this was a technique that you could use uh, for very close by objects, but when you go to very far away objects, the position of the star doesn't move much, eh? so the uncertainty on the, on the angle that you uh, can, uh, uh, can take, uh, uh, can measure, is, uh, is, uh, is very large with, with respect to the angle. Um, so somebody at around the same time uh, managed to measure uh, the distance to close by surface with these parallax techniques, uh, and that's all, uh, because once you, uh, you know the distance uh, um, of, uh, of one or, or a few of the surfaces, then you know you know how to calibrate uh, the luminosity of uh, of, uh, of the surface. Okay, um, this was truly revolutionary because uh, at that time uh, you could uh, measure distance to objects uh, uh, as far as uh, 100 uh, light years, but with these techniques uh, one could go to uh, 10 million of uh, light years, so one could really go to few megaparsecs. And this technique allowed uh, Hubble, for instance, to measure uh, the fact that Andromeda, so the, the closest uh, galaxies, was out of our, our galaxy. It was not uh, uh, belonging to, to our galaxies. And there was a big debate at the time about, uh, about this. Uh, and also allowed Hubble to measure the expansion of, uh, of the universe. So very often one says that the cosmology starts uh, with, uh, with Hubble, but probably we should say that uh, it started uh, with uh, uh, Heritas Juan Lewitt that uh, allowed at least to uh, the beginning of uh, really of cosmology. So <clears throat> this was very important, uh, uh, very important uh, discovery. So just to show you the relation between uh, the period and the luminosity. So this is the period, and this is the luminosity of surface. Uh, luminosity of, of surface. <coughs> And you observe some, something like that. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> of course, uh, um, in cosmology, well, if you use only cepheids, uh, you can go up to a few megaparsecs. Uh, but this is not enough. Uh, we would like to, if you want to serve uh, the cosmic acceleration, you have to go to farther uh, distances. Uh, so we will have to. Um, to use uh, different standard candles. And as you know, uh, the standard candles are uh, supernovae nowadays. And moreover, uh, also the, the uh, constant of distance have to be redefined because uh, uh, the space uh, time is expanding. So we have to find uh, a So the luminosity distance is uh, the way of measuring distances uh, uh, if you use uh, standard candles. Uh, so what is the luminosity of an object? It's uh, the, the radiated uh, electromagnetic energy in time. Okay. So it's, it's uh, dE over dT, basically. So it's measured in, uh, in, uh, in watts, it's power. Okay. Um, then the, we can define uh, the flux, uh, which is what uh, uh, telescopes uh, measure, which is what uh, you observe. And the flux uh, is given by the luminosity divided by, by the air. So the idea is that um, you have uh, a star with a given luminosity, uh, you surround it by, by, by a sphere, uh, which reduce uh, the distance uh, that you, uh, that where, where you are. So here you have an observer, and here you have uh, the star. Uh, and, uh, and this uh, A, this area, is the area of, uh, of the sphere. So it will be given by 4 pi the distance uh, squared, OK? 
Good. Uh, so basically, the flux is the amount of energy that reaches uh, the, the surface, a unit surface, for instance. Okay. Uh, now, in, a <coughs> in an expanding universe, so if the universe is expanding, uh, this area is not simply 4 pi the distance, okay? Uh, we have to use the metric that uh, we had uh, before. This time we have to integrate uh, over the surface uh, elements, the two-dimensional surface ele elements. And if you remember, this was, uh, so I have to make a double integral over a square t f of k chi, and then the angular um, the, the spherical surface uh, uh, element. And this uh, will give you 4 pi a square fk k square. Okay, simply. Um, now, the definition that we use in cosmology is exactly the definition of uh, luminosity distance that we use in cosmology is exactly the same as the one that we use uh, in, uh, in flight space-time. So we will say that uh, the flux observed is equal to the luminosity observed divided by the area, and the area depends on, uh, <coughs> on time, uh, on the time of observation and on the angular co-moving distance. And now we want to relate uh, um, the, the observed luminosity to the intrinsic luminosity of the object, knowing that, uh, uh, that this luminosity will be reshifted uh, with expansion, okay? So the observed luminosity is the emitted energy observed divided by the emitted time. And we can write this as uh, dE observed divided by dE emitted uh, dT emitted divided by dt observed times dE emitted divided by dt emitted. There are no colored charts. So this is the luminosity, the intrinsic luminosity of the object. And this uh, will give you, so this will give you a 1 over z, where z is the right shift factor. And this will give you another 1 over z right shift factor, OK? You, you cannot see it. So. This uh, will give you 1 over z, and this uh, will give you 1 over z. This is just the redshift of, uh, of, the, of the energy, and this is just due to the redshift of, uh, of the time, of the, of the period, if you want. So at the end, uh, if I... Um, at the end, uh, I will find that uh, the flux uh, observed uh, is equal to the luminosity of the emitted object, object sorry, divided by 1 plus z squared, a0 squared, which comes from here, is the scale factor evaluated today, and then f of k, chi squared, 
where chi is the co-moving uh, uh, angular distance uh, uh, from the star to today. Okay. And so we define the luminosity distance Well, the luminosity distance as one plus z. Exactly, this uh, is defined as dl squared. Okay. Okay. Now we uh, we need to compute uh, chi, the angular diameter distance, and uh, to compute it, uh, we can just look at uh, um, uh, light geodesics. Ah, thanks. Wow. Okay. Uh, so we just solve uh, this equation. So chi is equal to the integral between uh, the time of emission to the time of observation of uh, d uh, t over a of t. And then I, I, I change the variable. I go from uh, the time of observation to the uh, value of the scale factor. Sorry, uh, from the time of emission to the value of the scale factor at emission to the value of the scale factor at observation, dA over A, dT over dA. Okay. Then uh, you have defined uh, probably the Hubble rate as uh, a dot over a right. So I use uh, this uh, here to uh, rewrite uh, the same, but in terms of uh, the Hubble rate. And finally, I convert uh, uh, the scale factor in terms of uh, the redshift. So I use uh, that uh, A of Z is equal to A0, so the scale factor today, divided by one, by one uh, plus Z. this here, and I can integrate between uh, the redshift uh, zero today. Sorry, let me, there is a factor one over a zero here, and the integral goes from uh, zero today to the redshift of uh, the source, dz, and what I left with uh, is just h of z. because uh, uh, I use that uh, dA is equal to minus dz, one plus z squared, a zero, and this uh, canceled uh, this a squared here, the denominator. Okay.
so I can finally write an expression that we can use for the luminosity distance. Um, but before doing that, uh, let me define uh, two things. Well, one uh, is, I think, uh, yes, uh, Asim uh, defined this uh, in his course, but anyway, well, sometimes uh, we will use uh, this quantity, which is the ratio of uh, the Hubble rate uh, uh, as a function of uh, the redshift divided by, sorry, <laughs> by the Hubble rate uh, today. Okay, and, and uh, another definition is uh, um, omega curvature today, okay, which is defined as uh, uh, K, the curvature, divided by A0 squared, H0 squared. And this is defined with the minus because we want that the sum over all uh, omegas um, plus uh, omega k is equal to 1. And I will use the same notation as, uh, as a sim in uh, adding a 0 when, uh, when I'm evaluating uh, the, the, omega, the omegas uh, today. Okay? So omega is uh, the usual uh, critical density, uh, the usual uh, energy density divided by the critical density. So 8 pi g rho i divided by 3h squared, basically, okay? For a given species uh, i. <coughs> now, a0, by inverting this relation, can be written as h0 minus 1 over the square root of uh, omega k, evaluated today, okay. And so now I'm going to rewrite uh, this expression by using, by using the expression of the co-moving uh, um, uh, radial distance, the co-moving radius. So uh, I will have, uh, and I'm, I'm using the expression for a zero from here. So we have a0 minus 1 divided by square root of omega k0. And then f of k square root of omega k0. The integral between 0 and z, where z is uh, the redshift uh, of emission. E Okay. Any questions? Why there is a? Well, just because uh, I'm integrating between 0 and z, so I had to change uh, the variable. I'm uh, just uh, adding a tilde. Z is the right shift uh, uh, of, uh, of emission. OK. Sorry. Yeah. If you have it, let me use the definition of A0 and you didn't define it right? So this is infinite, but, <coughs> but uh, if you expand, uh, this function, so this function is uh, either, so remember, f of k of uh, chi is uh, sinus of chi, chi, or hyperbolic sinus of chi, okay? And for a small uh, argument, for a small chi, all these functions are start linear in chi, and then uh, there will be a third chi squared, or plus uh, one third k squared, or, or it's just k. So the, the, um, the zero curvature here cancels with this one. Okay. And you have a finite, uh, <laughs> finite result, of course. And in fact, um, you see immediately that, uh, this, uh, uh, that the dependence uh, on, um, on uh, the curvature uh, appears only at, order, uh, at cubic order 
in a, in a chi and in z in the redshift. So I can, uh, in principle, I can expand in the redshift. And this is what I'm going to do now. Uh, so we can, um, so supernovae are, are measured uh, at low, at low redshift. Um, so let's say uh, around uh, smaller than, uh, than one. Um, so first of all, at, at, if I expand a linear order, uh, if I expand this expression at linear order in Z, I can consider E to be, uh, to be constant and I find uh, that, uh, so linear order, linear in Z, I find that uh, DLZ is equal to A0 minus one, this one, this I can neglect, times Z, which is uh, the Hubble law. Okay, but of course I want to go higher in uh, in um, second order to see the effect of uh, <coughs> of uh, the cosmic acceleration, and uh, so to to do the calculation, which I will leave you. Uh, I will leave it to do it uh, um, as an exercise. Uh, I, can, uh, I can expand uh, this function for small uh, arguments. And uh, as I said, uh, the first term uh, is linear, and, uh, and the second term will be cubic. So I can neglect the, uh, the second term in this expansion. And I will just uh, use. Uh, well, tilde, the, the linear term, eh? and then I expand this, uh, uh, I will have, uh, I will expand this in, uh, in, in Taylor series. Zero, one half. Okay. So for exercise, you can compute uh, this, of course, will give you, this term uh, will give you h0 uh, minus 1. And, you, and, and this, uh, it is left as an exercise to compute uh, this term here. The term second order in z. And uh, you will find that uh, the L z to derivative is equal to h0 minus 1, 1 minus a dot dot h over a, evaluated today. Okay. So now we see appearing, uh, the, the acceleration uh, appears here in the expansion of the luminosity distance uh, as, uh, in terms of the redshift. And uh, uh, it is um, traditional to define uh, the deceleration parameter in this way, to describe uh, the acceleration of the universe. And the reason uh, why there is a minus sign here, as you know, is historical. Because before discovering the accelerated expansion, uh, um, people thought that uh, uh, the universe was uh, decelerating. Okay, nobody was well. Nobody. Uh, most uh, uh, most people were expecting to see a decelerated uh, universe. Okay, and of course, uh, uh, sometimes you use Q zero, which is uh, all this uh, evaluated today. Okay, so we, we can write down 
the Taylor expansion of the luminosity distance as uh, hz or minus 1, z, which is a linear term. And then we have 1 plus uh, 1 half, 1 minus q0, which comes from uh, this term here, the 1 half uh, just from the Taylor expansion, z plus uh, order z cube. Questions? Okay, very good. So now we have uh, an expression that relates uh, the luminosity distance to the, the uh, uh, deceleration parameter. Uh, so we are going to talk about uh, supernovae as standard candles to measure the luminosity distance as a function of the redshift and infer this Q0 parameter, okay? So what are supernovae type 1 A's? Uh, well, first of all, uh, as we said, uh, they are uh, uh, ideal to, uh, as candle, a standard candle to uh, to go to high redshift because they are extremely luminous. Okay? They are very bright, uh, so they can be seen at uh, much uh, uh, farther distances uh, than, uh, than cephates. Um, so, so the idea is the following. In fact, um, I have a... No, sorry. No, what am I doing? So just to... So you see that uh, the supernova can be seen is as, as luminous, basically, as, uh, as a galaxy. Uh, and let's explain uh, why. Uh, so the idea is the following. You have a, uh, let's suppose that you have a, a white uh, dwarf, OK, uh, in a spiraling in binary with, uh, with another star, with a companion, OK? So you have something like that. And, uh, um, and there is, a, and, and the companion is, a, well, the white dwarf is accreting material from, uh, from the companion, something like, like that, okay? Here you have a, a nice uh, um, artistic uh, view of, uh, of this. So white dwarfs are, are the remnants of uh, standard uh, stars. Um, and um, uh, in, in which uh, the, uh, so as you know, sta <coughs> in stars there is always a competition between uh, uh, gravitational uh, uh, force and, uh, and, uh, and pressure, okay, in order to sustain uh, the, the star. And while in normal stars the pressure is, uh, is due to thermal, uh, uh, thermal energy, in a, in, a dry, in a white dwarf is due to the electron uh, uh, degeneracy pressure, okay? And uh, um, typically, uh, white dwarf uh, stars uh, have a mass uh, which is smaller of uh, a limit, uh, which is called a Chandrasekhar limit, uh, which is about 1.4 uh, solar masses. And uh, above, uh, uh, this limit, uh, the uh, degeneracy pressure of the electrons is no longer uh, uh, enough uh, to sustain uh, the, gravitational, uh, the gravitational force, okay? So something uh, happens uh, at around uh, when, uh, when the mass uh, um, uh, reaches uh, this limit. So <coughs> typically, when you have this binary system, uh, uh, the mass of the, of the white uh, dwarf, uh, and here we have a companion. 
the mass of the white dwarf starts, uh, starts increasing until the point uh, where uh, uh, it, uh, um, it, go, it grows uh, higher than uh, uh, the Chandrasekha limit. And uh, um, the internal temperature of the star uh, increases. And uh, there are processes that were not allowed before that uh, start uh, taking place. In particular, the most violent process is what is called the carbon fusion. Uh, so so this person here, so the car, so typically white, white dwarfs are, are made of carbon and, and oxygen, which are the remnants of, uh, of uh, standard stars. And uh, at, at this temperature, at, at this um, value of, uh, of the mass, the carbon can, uh, uh, can fuse. It can form heavy elements. And this process is extremely violent. And in fact, in fact it ends uh, with, the, with an explosion, which can be seen uh, very far away. This is sometimes called the carbon detonation. So it's a sort of a runaway um, reaction that, uh, uh, that basically ends up in an explosion. So because uh, this happens always uh, at uh, this critical uh, mass, the luminosity emitted by the supernova is a sort of a standard. It's sort of the same for all uh, supernovae type 1a. In fact, we can, uh, we can show... Um, Filippo, there yeah. is a request to explain uh, the carbon detonation process once more. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, well, uh, yeah, ju just that uh, when... Uh, so, when, um, um, so I, I, as I said before, when uh, the mass uh, of the white dwarf uh, starts becoming higher than the Chandrasekhar limit, okay? uh, the, the, the star starts collapsing because the electron degeneracy pressure is not enough uh, to counteract uh, the, the gravitational uh, force. When it starts uh, uh, collapsing, temperature increases. Okay? Before, the temperature was, uh, was uh, not even defined in the sense that the, the pressure was due to the, the electron degeneracy. But, but now we have a, an increase in temperature and this process that before uh, could not take place uh, now starts uh, uh, taking place. So this is fusion of, uh, of nuclei, of, uh, of carbon, to produce uh, heavier elements, okay? And uh, um, so, and, and, and one can show the, the characteristic uh, luminosity versus uh, time, light curve. Here is luminosity, and here is uh, the time uh, from uh, the peak uh, of the luminosity. I'm going to explain what it is in days. Okay, so the, the luminosity of the supernova from explosion peaks, uh, and uh, by definition we put uh, this peak uh, at uh, day zero. Okay, but you know, and then the typical time scale uh, is uh, weeks, uh, is of the order of uh, weeks. Uh, okay, and uh, one observes. So, <coughs> by the way, this peak uh, is due to the production of nickel, which uh, uh, when, uh, when it's produced uh, is extremely luminous, is extremely bright, okay? The, there is a, a lot of uh, um, uh, electromagnetic radiation associated uh, with, uh, with it. And uh, one can see that uh, um, Th those, uh, uh, those supernovae that, because of a different composition, uh, for instance, because of, uh, 
uh, less carbon or less oxygen in, uh, in the supernova have uh, a smaller peak, uh, um, their luminosity uh, time is also, is also shorter. Okay. But, however, there is a, a way of uh, correcting uh, from this effect uh, and standardize the supernova. There's a relation, in fact, a simple uh, relation that has been uh, complexified uh, uh, later on, but there is a simple relation uh, between this, uh, this luminosity course. And at the end, uh, you, can, uh, uh, you can basically uh, find a way of, uh, of, um, of uh, well, standardize the supernova into standard candles. In fact, this is what... Um, so there is a way of correcting uh, um, uh, the fact that uh, different supernovas uh, uh, release, uh, uh, have a different luminosity, but because uh, we know the relation between the luminosity and the, and the time-like curve, uh, we can, uh, we can uh, standardize them, and uh, we can, uh, we can uh, have uh, uh, calibrate them, and we can have a uh, standard, uh, standard candles. Okay. So the typical, uh, the typical relation that is used uh, uh, to standardize supernova is called Phillips uh, relation. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, yeah, because uh, white dwarfs uh, have different composition. Okay, so the, the amount of carbon, uh, oxygen, etc., is different in different uh, white dwarfs. So although they all uh, uh, start exploding at the same uh, mass, more or less, uh, their luminosity is, uh, is different because of that. So the amount of nickel, for instance, that is produced uh, or other heavy elements that is produced is, uh, is different. Okay. Um, so, of course, you, you measure supernovae very far away, but then uh, how do, so you remember before we, we talked about cephates and we said that at the same time uh, as the swan lewitt uh, discovery, there were people who measured the, the, um, uh, the distance of uh, cephates using parallax. Now you also have to measure the distance of uh, some supernovae to, to infer the, the, the true distance. Uh, sorry, to infer the, uh, the absolute uh, brightness, so the intrinsic luminosity of a, of a supernova. So how, how do we do that? Can you imagine? <coughs> yeah? Very good. Exactly. So, uh, yes. So very far away supernovae are calibrated using closer, close-by supernovae. These close-by supernovae are calibra calibrated using uh, cephates. And uh, these cephates, uh, which are far away, are calibrated uh, using close-by cephates, which are calibrated uh, using parallax. Okay. So it's uh, a complicated uh, process, but, but uh, it's what it is. I mean, this is what we can do. So at the end, we, also, we always use uh, parallax. So, of course, uh, now we have uh, uh, much better instruments than, uh, than before to measure the position of stars, etc. But, uh, but there is a, a, what is called the, the, the cosmic distance ladder, so a sort of a ladder, and I think I have here a plot. So you see, <coughs> first, uh, first we use parallax to calibrate uh, 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 nearby cephates, uh, and then we, we calibrate farther away cephates that are used to calibrate uh, uh, supernovae, which are used to calibrate far, farther away supernovae. So we expect, uh, uh, well, we, we expect that uh, <coughs> there could be also some, uh, um, some possible uh, redshift dependence in, uh, in these models. But uh, let's, let's first uh, look at what we can obtain with, uh, with supernova. 
OK. The discovery of Q0. OK, this is uh, uh, so the discovery that the universe is accelerating, uh, yes? Yeah. Um, so if we wanted to show a supernova which is farther away on that same plot, how would it look like? Would it just be a fainter one or the shape would be different? Well, on this plot, I'm, I'm showing the, um, uh, the intrinsic luminosity of the supernova. So, so it will be the same uh, whether it's uh, farther away or uh, if, there, if there are no evolutionary effects, uh, it will be the same. So th this is the intrinsic luminosity in this plot. Okay. But somehow you want to break the, the generacy with distance. Like in a sense that you are saying there is this variability in luminosity right, even at the same distance. Yeah, at the same distance there is the variability in luminosity, but you can break it. Ah, you can break it because uh, because uh, the the decay. You see the um, the time like uh, curve is shorter for dimmer supernovae at the same distance. So so the time like curve is ma lasts much longer for brighter supernovae than uh, for dimmer supernovae. Okay, so and if so I you see can something like this far away, it would be faint but broader. So would exactly. So yeah, yeah. So you can standardize them with the, with the simple relation. That uh, well, the Phillips relation does not depend on color, etc. But then you can improve the simple relation. But there is a yeah. In fact, is one one parameter relation. Yeah, but this you can take it into. The question was, uh, yes, yeah, so <laughs> good. The question was, uh, uh, there is also a time delay uh, for distance supernova. Yes, uh, there will be, and you can take it into account. Uh, however, when you calibrate the supernova, you do it uh, uh, rather close. So there, the time delay is, uh, is totally uh, negligible. There are also lensing effects. There are many effects that people take into account. So. But the calibration is done at much uh, lower redshift than, than what we use uh, to, uh, to explore, uh, to, to measure the acceleration. Yeah. Can you explain again the effect of calibration? Yes, so, um, so it, question. yeah, the, the question was, can you explain again the calibration? So I'm not, I, I'm not going to show you the relation. It's very, in fact, uh, it, it's very simple. Uh, it, it's a very simple relation. Um, but the idea is the following. You, you, you observe a pattern. So the fact that uh, brighter luminosity, so when the peak associated to nickel is higher, have a, a longer time of, uh, uh, so the time light curve, this one, is much longer. So you can see it also here, OK? is much longer for the supernovae than uh, those that have a, a, a lower uh, brightness and a lower peak. Here, the time is much shorter. And there is a relation with one parameter that you can, uh, uh, the, the, there is a fit that, that you can make uh, uh, to uh, basically to, yes, to, to, to relate or, or to find uh, the, the same, uh, the same uh, uh, curve, the same luminosity. Yeah. I mean, the relation to separation. Ah, the relation between, ah, OK, OK. So the question was how you calibrate them, how you calibrate the, the absolute uh, magnitude of, uh, of this uh, supernova. Yes, OK. So this is uh, shown here. So, so you have a far away supernova. Sometimes, ah, no, sorry, it's my fault. So you have far away supernovae, okay? Well, let's start, let's start here. First of all, uh, 
uh, you calibrate the cephate. So you, you know the luminosity of the cephate, uh, and therefore you know the distance, okay? Uh, of all cephates, also of uh, faraway cephates. Then uh, if you have a cephate uh, in a galaxy which also contains uh, a supernova, then you can uh, calibrate uh, that supernova, okay? So you, 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 you observe a supernova, for instance, one that is very, is very bright and uh, has a long uh, uh, time-like curve, then you calibrate that one. So you know its intrinsic luminosity, and you can infer the intrinsic luminosity of, of all the others if you trust uh, this relation, okay? Well, you observe, uh, how, how can you know that they are nearby? Is, is that, uh, okay. Uh, well, I, I think that you, you see that uh, they are, well, first of all, uh, around there is, uh, there is uh, nothing, and then probably you can also see that they are bound, they, they, they have a velocity that uh, corresponds to, to the galaxy. Well, I must say, I'm not an expert of, uh, of that, but uh, yeah, I think uh, this, this is, uh, probably quite standard to know. Yeah. Yes, I'm sure that, uh, that this is done, uh, that the spectra are, well, first of all, uh, we use the spectra to measure the redshift, uh, of course. Well, we haven't talked about the redshift, but because this is uh, uh, well known, uh, you can measure the redshift by looking at the spectra and by looking at, at, uh, at the redshift of the spectra. But uh, yes, the luminosity and the, and the color of the supernova is used. Uh, we know that we, we can study the abundance. Uh, we can try to use also the abundance of uh, uh, of the, of the elements of the wide dwarfs to, uh, to improve these relations, uh, uh, yeah. So is that, uh, is the process for this relation is directly related to the abundance by some? Is directly related to? The abundance by some known form. Well, this I don't think. Uh, the, the, so the, the um, I think that um, most, of, so the, the, the question was uh, whether this uh, parameter uh, here was related to the abundance uh, uh, of the elements. Uh, well, I think that all these, uh, um, uh, all these models are very empirical and that, uh, mm. and that we don't have uh, a full understanding of the supernova explosion, uh, like that we can, we can really simulate it on uh, uh, a exactly as a function of uh, the abundance, et cetera, on a, on a computer. Most of these relations that are used to, um, to standardize the supernovae are, are really empirical. Okay, so th there is some uncertainty also there. Okay, how much time do we have? 15 minutes? Okay. Okay, so, Well, now we want to measure this uh, acceleration. And uh, so what uh, the luminosity distance, uh, so wh what we, uh, le let's uh, plot something uh, which has no dimension. So it's the luminosity distance as a function of redshift times H zero. You remember the formula that I had written before. This was given by uh, uh, Z uh, one plus uh, one alpha one minus Q zero Z, Z, okay? So we are plotting this. Uh, let's put some uh, 1.5 here, uh, one here, 0 0.5 here, and the redshift here. And uh, let's go up to one more or less, okay? And we can, uh, so the, 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 the curve starts at zero, and uh, let's draw three different uh, curves. One, uh, well, it's one for uh, Q0 equal to zero, a universe that is not accelerating. One for Q0 smaller than zero. So here we have acceleration. 
and one for Q0 larger than zero. So here the universe is decelerated. Okay. And uh, what we measure, in fact, uh, is, uh, is a lease. Uh, so if you, <coughs> at, um, let's say that at fixed uh, redshift, okay, if you, if you consider um, uh, supernova at shift redshift, uh, at uh, fixed redshift, um, the supernova that we measured look uh, dimmer, okay, then, uh, uh, so they, they look more far away, farther away, so they look dimmer than, than what they would be if uh, there was no accelerated expansion or if uh, the universe was decelerating. And if, at fixed uh, um, distance, they look uh, farther away or they look, uh, uh, Sorry, at fixed distance, no, they, they look closer, so they, they look that they are shifting uh, slower, okay? okay. Um, yeah, so this makes sense uh, because the expansion of the universe uh, increases uh, uh, in time, so they should have started uh, slower, okay? They should be closer and they should have started uh, with a slower uh, redshift because uh, later on uh, this uh, expansion has, has, uh, has increased. Okay, so it makes sense that we find something like that. And I think I have uh, um, a plot uh, here that I took from, uh, from a paper uh, of 2000 but where, where, you can, uh, where you can see the difference between, uh, uh, well, uh, several uh, universes. Uh, for instance, uh, a universe where there is no cosmological constant and and, uh, and, and uh, uh, omega matter, the moments of, uh, of the matter or, or non-relativistic component is, uh, is one. Um, and, uh, and you can, well, you can clear, clearly see that uh, supernovae uh, are showing us that we are not living in, uh, in such a universe. I don't remember what I have. Oh yes, here I have uh, uh, a compilation of supernovae as for uh, today, this was from uh, 2001, is the Pantheon uh, compilation. So uh, it gives you an idea of the fact that we can go to, uh, to high redshift and we have uh, a much, uh, a many more uh, supernovae than, than in the plot uh, before. Um, Okay, so let me. So I would like to, to discuss uh, a different way to, to measure um, the, the, the luminosity distance, uh, which is uh, not uh, using uh, not using light, but gravitational waves. Okay, so um, you know that uh, if, you, well, uh, in, uh, in 2015 we observed uh, uh, binaries of uh, black holes. Uh, emitting gravitational waves. So we, we observe the, the gravitational waves emitted from these binaries. And uh, the, the strain, uh, so the amplitude of the gravitational wave emitted uh, is inversely proportional to the luminosity distance of these objects. And then uh, uh, is proportional to uh, some, uh, some, some power, uh, five over three, of, um, of a quantity which is called uh, the chirp mass, uh, which is, uh, well, you can define it, it's, it's not very important here, the definition, but it's given by N1 times N2, so the, the product of the two um, binaries to the three-fifth, divided by the sum of the masses of the two binaries to the one-fifth, okay? 
And this combination comes out from uh, really from uh, Kepler, uh, Kepler laws. Okay. And then uh, uh, <clears throat> and then uh, the amplitude of gravitational waves emitted uh, depends also on the frequency of the gravitational waves to the power of two thirds. Okay. So if you know, so you, you can observe the frequency. Okay, is the one that you see in your. Uh, uh, in, in your uh, instrument, in your interferometer. And uh, if you knew the chirp mass of the, these objects, you could infer the luminosity, the, sorry, the, um, the luminosity distance, okay? And, uh, um, and in fact, uh, you can uh, infer the chirp mass because uh, by using the quadruple formula, uh, you can uh, basically compute uh, um, the, the change in frequency of uh, the gravitational waves, uh, which is due to the fact that uh, these two uh, objects are, um, since they release gravitational waves, are, are getting closer and closer, so the frequency increases in, uh, in time, okay? And uh, it increases in time due to the, to the release of gravitational waves, and there is... Uh, a relation, well, this is not very important. There is a relation between uh, this uh, change of frequency and the chirp mass. Let's see, it's the following. So you can infer the chirp mass. Given the chirp mass, you can infer, you can measure uh, the strain and, and you can infer the luminosity distance. Okay? So it's a way of uh, measuring uh, the luminosity distance of. Uh, of an object. The problem is that, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, you know this is a, a the yes, this is uh, in principle is the redshift chirp mass, and this is exactly what I was coming to. Yeah, no. <laughs> yeah. The problem is that you don't know the redshift, and there is a, so in principle this mass uh, is the is a redshift uh, uh, mass, which means that. Uh, uh, for instance, the same signal from uh, a supernova with uh, uh, mass, uh, uh, with shear mass m at uh, redshift zero, is given by a supernova with shear uh, mass uh, measured, shear mass uh, m over one plus z at uh, at some redshift z. Okay. So there is a, a degeneracy uh, with the redshift, uh, which is called mass redshift degeneracy, uh, which uh, does not allow you to infer directly the redshift from the supernova, so the, the, from, the, from the binary. So the nice thing of the binary is that uh, uh, it's self-calibrated concerning the luminosity distance. We can, uh, we can know the luminosity distance, but, but just looking at the uh, at it, we don't need the cephates. We don't need to uh, calibrate it with other objects. But the problem is that we are missing uh, the redshift, OK? So nowadays, uh, there are um, several ways that uh, people are exploring to get the redshift. So I'm just going to. I'm just going to list them uh, here. Well, uh, yeah, I will show something later. Okay. So, well, the first of all is to have uh, a, a, a direct, uh, direct uh, counterpart. Example, uh, in, in uh, 2017, uh, we measured the merging of uh, uh, two neutral stars, and we could detect uh, at the same time uh, the gravitational wave and the, and the gamma rays emitted, uh, and we could uh, really observe the redshift. Yes?
this is uh, uh, is coming from the Well, it's coming from the fact that uh, all these quantities here have to be redshifted uh, at the moment of, uh, so, the, so you observe this, but this law holds, uh, uh, for, for, for instance, the frequency that, that I put here is the, is the frequency at that time of emission, okay, which is redshifted with respect to mine, okay. But also the chirp mass, uh, the, real, uh, the real definition of a chirp mass that I put here is a redshifted chirp mass, okay? So, so all, the, all the quantities that, that uh, because uh, to infer uh, this, uh, this equation, uh, I'm using, uh, so for instance, the quadruple formula, I'm using the quadruple formula over there, so I'm using frequencies over there, except, but then I have to redshift them here, and... Uh, um, okay, one is to, to detect uh, uh, one is that uh, the, the binary release uh, uh, electromagnetic energy, but this is very rare, okay? For the moment we have seen, uh, well, we have seen uh, other, other uh, merging of neutral stars or neutral star and the black hole, but we haven't seen uh, electromagnetic uh, and, um, light associated with them. Another one is, uh, is uh, to, uh, to see galaxies uh, around uh, uh, localized uh, at the same, uh, uh, the same position as uh, the emitters of uh, the gravitational waves. So to look at catalogs and try to correlate uh, the emission with uh, the presence of, uh, of galaxies. Um, then another way could be uh, um, knowing the, the source, so the, the mass distribution. Of, uh, of binaries. Imagine that uh, we know that for certain reasons we have a lot of binaries with, uh, with certain masses or we have a mass gap, okay? For the moment it's not clear whether, so this mass distribution is not, uh, is not uh, totally clear for the events that we have in LIGO, but maybe one day we will uh, manage to, to measure the distribution of, uh, of uh, so the, the number of uh, of binaries as a function of uh, their mass, and uh, there will be some peak, uh, mass gap, or something like that, okay? Uh, well, in this case, uh, we have uh, something that tells you, uh, that tells you where, uh, where these masses are, and you can infer the, the real, ma the true masses. And, uh, and finally, uh, tidal uh, deformations. So what I said here is restricted to the point particle uh, approximation. So it's restricted to treating the, the, the two objects as a, as a point particle without, uh, 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 without the size, without an internal structure. But uh, in the case of a neutral stars, for instance, uh, tidal deformation are important. Uh, they determine the, the, um, the internal structure of the star. And uh, <clears throat> this breaks uh, this uh, redshift uh, mass uh, degeneracy, and in principle, you could infer something about, uh, about the redshift. Okay, so in principle, these are potentially interesting uh, for, uh, for the future. Let's see. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think I'm gonna stop here. Any question? Any further question? Okay, I don't see any. No, there is a question over there. Wait. Sorry, maybe I missed it, but when you say galaxies, you mean like determine the host galaxy of the binary? So these binaries will be in, yeah, will be in galaxies. Uh, so ideally, you would, you would like to infer uh, which galaxy uh, the binary belongs to. This is not al always possible, but uh, you may try to do it statistically, okay? So, so you have uh, a lot of binaries emitted, uh, you have a galaxy catalog, and you can try to fit uh, uh, parameters using, uh, yeah, using 
trying to associate. So these binaries will come from a, from a place uh, where there are galaxies. Okay, and uh, and you know these galaxies here because of uh, galaxy class, uh, galaxy catalogs, and uh, and you try to associate uh, 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 this galaxy, this uh, binary to uh, to a galaxy. But but if you cannot do it, uh, if you cannot associate to this single galaxy, you can uh, try to do it in a statistical way. In the sense, uh, you will have uh, uh, some redshift parameters that you will fit uh, and. Uh, yeah, you, you try to fit uh, in, a, in a statistical way. Maybe we can postpone a third of questions to the discussion okay. session. So now we take a break. Let's thank Filippo.